fascinating things, clocks, aren't they? But actually I've always been much more interested myself in the true nature of time. I think my fascination with time first started many years ago when I read a book by H.G. Wells and that book was called The Time Machine. Well after reading The Time Machine I became quite motivated to try and find out as much as I could about the true nature of time. Now our intuition tells us that time is absolute but can we trust our intuition? Well absolutely not. Our early predecessors thought the earth was flat and <laughs> When you look around, who can blame them? It appears to be quite obviously flat, doesn't it? I mean, how could it be anything else? Well, they were wrong. They also thought that the sun went around the earth. And when you see the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, it seems quite obvious, doesn't it, the sun's going around the earth. But once again, they were wrong. So the lesson to learn here is that we can't always trust our intuition. Now, the speed of light is very fast, isn't it? Actually, the speed of light was first measured in the 19th century and was found to, to move at a constant 186,000 miles a second. And once again, our intuition was wrong because <laughs> We thought the speed of light was inst instantaneous, and it wasn't. Now, I'm going to try and do a couple of thought experiments to um, demonstrate how this dynamic nature of time works. And our first experiment involves a man on a moving train. And this man has a rifle, and he takes the rifle and he fires a rifle bullet in the direction the train's moving. And what we want to ascertain here is the speed of the rifle bullet. Well, it's a very simple calculation, isn't it? Because all we do is we add the speed that the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun to the speed of the train, and we get a sensible result for the speed of the rifle bullet. Now, this time we take away the man's rifle and we give him a torch and we're going to do the same experiment again but this time we're going to do it with a flash of light so once again he takes the torch and gives a quick flash in the direction the train's moving and the flash goes streaking off into the distance and this time we want to once again ascertain the speed of the flash of light but this time, because the speed of light is constant, it means we can't add the speed of the train to the speed of the flash of light. The speed of light is constant. It's the same for all observers. Now this has some interesting consequences, as we'll see, by our second thought experiment. And our second thought experiment involves a man in a very fast rocket ship that's streaking away from the Earth at 185,000 miles a second. Now that's just a bit below the speed of light. And our second observer is going to remain on the Earth and just watch what's going on. Well, once again, our astronaut observer takes his flashlight, gives a quick flash of light, the flash of light goes streaking off in the direction that the rocket ship's moving and we'd assume he has some accurate measuring equipment to measure the speed of the flash of light but he would see it moving away from the rocket ship at 186,000 miles a second and we'd assume that the observer on the earth can also measure the flash of light accurately and he would also see that flash of light moving away at 186,000 miles a second because the speed of light is constant and it's the same for all observers regardless of what speed they might be travelling at. So, so far, both observers are in agreement. They both agree that that flash of light is travelling away at 186,000 miles a second. 
Now what's interesting here is that our observer on the Earth can also see the rocket travelling away from him at 185,000 miles a second. Now, he would have to conclude, he would be forced to conclude that the flash of light is receding from the rocket ship at only 1,000 miles a second. Now this is an extremely interesting result because here we have two independent observers and they've both got different results. It's a paradox. So which one's right? Well, enter stage left, Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein agonised over this problem and he got to thinking about speed and he thought, well, what is speed? Speed has two parameters. One parameter is distance, the other parameter is time, miles per hour, miles per second, whatever. And Albert Einstein suddenly thought, well, one of these parameters must be in error. And this is where Albert Einstein had his great insight into the true nature of time, because Albert Einstein realised that time is not absolute and time has this dynamic nature which effectively means that everybody carries their own time with them. So of course Einstein then realised that these two independent measurements of speed involved a parameter that was in fact a variable, time. And of course, once he realised this, the paradox of their disagreement was resolved. And they were both right. Now this of course was the basis of the theory of relativity and Albert Einstein, not satisfied with what he had achieved so far, went on to develop the theory to actually explain what gravity was. And up until this time, we had not the slightest idea of what gravity was. But that's another story. Now, one of the consequences of this would be that if we, if we assume that the two observers started off as being twins, now that means to say they would be the same age. And at some point, our astronaut observer decides to turn around and come back to the Earth. Now, when he arrived back at the Earth, he would find that they would not be the same age anymore. He would find that his twin would be older than him. And the difference in age would obviously depend on the speed that he'd been travelling at and the closer he'd got to the speed of light. It could be a few days, it could be a few years. He could find that his twin had expired many years ago. So this is one of the consequences of, of travelling at speeds close to the speed of light. Um, your time will change. What it means is, in effect, everybody carries their own time with them. If we assume that our ground-based observer had a, an extremely powerful telescope and he looked at, at his astronaut twin speeding away and let's assume this, this telescope was so powerful that it could actually see a clock on the spaceship and he would actually see the clock running slow and if he could see his astronaut twin, he would actually see him moving as if in slow motion. This is the dynamic nature of time. It's, it's very weird and it's, it's almost like science fiction, but 
it is well established scientific fact. Now, I think it might be quite interesting to speculate what might be possible for humanity to achieve in the way of interstellar space travel. Can we ever go to the stars? On the face of it, it would seem not. If we consider the size of our galaxy, it's a hundred thousand light years from edge to edge. Now that's to say that it would take a flash of light a hundred thousand years to travel from one edge to the other. Now nothing can travel faster than light and there are fundamental reasons for that which I won't go into now but it is impossible to travel faster than light. It is possible to travel close to the speed of light which is all we need to do really. Now that flash of light, as I just said, has taken 100,000 years to travel from one edge of the galaxy to the other. But that is only from the point of view of a stationary observer. Now, from the point of view of that flash of light, it's made that journey instantaneously. And the reason for that is if you approach the speed of light, your time gets slower and slower and slower and if you could actually attain the speed of light which I've just said is actually impossible but if you could in theory your time would actually stop altogether so that flash of light exists really outside time time doesn't exist for that flash of light. So it, it's actually made that journey from edge to edge of the galaxy instantaneously. Now it follows from this that by travelling very close to the speed of light we could travel vast distances in space in a relatively short space of time. Now, it might be interesting to speculate even further on what type of craft might be needed to achieve such a journey. Well, I think it's probably worth stating from the outset that such a journey would need to be a one-way trip because there wouldn't be much point in returning to an Earth millions of years in the future and find that the Sun had expired millions of years ago. So it's going to have to be a one-way trip and it would obviously have to carry a large section of humanity with it. So it's going to need to be <laughs> really big, probably need to be as big as a small city I would think and it would obviously have to be completely self-contained capable of sustaining a community of people for an indefinite period of time. Now it's also going to need a propulsion unit and this propulsion unit is, is going to need to be able to um, provide a sustained acceleration for an unlimited period of time. I think a good acceleration to work with would be 1G because 1G would provide an artificial gravity in the craft and if we could sustain an acceleration of 1G for a period of, I don't know, four or five years, it, it would 
get us up to some very appreciable speeds approaching the speed of light and would give us the capability of reaching most of the stars in our galaxy. Now, such a propulsion unit, of course, is beyond our wildest dreams at the moment. But who knows, technology surprises us and progresses at a rate that's been quite astounding over the last couple of hundred years. So maybe one day in the future we may go to the stars. It certainly won't be in my time though. <laughs>